So yesterday the internet was all on fire because Kim Kardashian filed a trademark for a kimono for her new shapewear line that's coming up. People on Twitter, <laughs> that's right, I said Twitter. I'm on Twitter now and y'all can follow me on Twitter at Lakanya Murray. That's where you can find me. But anywho, the people on Twitter were all, they were talking about culture appropriation and acting like they were in shock. But why? It's Kim who? Kardashian. The Kardashians are known for cultural appropriation. So, I know y'all turn in here for the tea, right? But not just any tea. You want that legal tea. And honey, it's hot today. Welcome to the legal tea, where we talk about pop culture from a legal view. I'm your host, brand attorney, Lakanya Murray, owner of Off The Mark IP Solutions, where we help clients throughout the United States protect their brand content and ideas through trademarks, copyrights, and contracts. A good one for you today. So let's get started. So you know how we like to do here at The Legal Tea when we hear anybody doing anything with, any, like, with trademarks, we like to go snooping, right? So we knew that Kim Kardashian, she said she had this thing under wraps, uh, and she was so excited to finally announce that she was launching a lingerie line. And so while everybody else was all upset over cultural appropriation, which I get it, I understand, I was like, hmm, let's see what this trademark is looking like. So I went and I did what I do, which is went to the USPTO database to get some more information about Kim Kardashian's kimono trademark. And this is what I found, right? First of all, when you just look up the word kimono, in the USPTO database, I want you guys to know there are over 100 uses of that word that are filed as trademarks. That's the first thing I want you to know. 11 of those are, were filed by Kimono Intimates LLC. Yeah, Kimono Intimates LLC, that's the um, corporation that she's doing this business under. They have 11 trademarks. They're all 1B applications, which is what I intended to find. I went there. I went into the database thinking, you know what? We know the Kardashians are known for co you know, cultural appropriation, but what can we learn from them business-wise? Because we cannot deny that business-wise and money-wise, they are doing their thing, right? So I went in there expecting to find a 1B application. So this is what we know. She just launched, what, yesterday? So our June 26th. She launched on June 26th. The first trademark application she filed was last year was in March of 2018 so she didn't wait until she launched and made some money before she filed for a trademark that's that's one thing I want you to know and that's one thing that I want you to take away from this that she didn't wait until she got ready to launch to file her trademark all right but let's get into these trademarks right I told you she has 11 trademarks she has 11 trademarks she has one two three for kimono for, let's see, perfume, deodorant, personal use, and body spray, leather and shoulder bags, tote bags, and then for clothing or lingerie, namely underwear, panties, hosiery, hosieries, garters, garter belts, and so on and so forth. Those applications were filed. There's three separate applications for the word kimono. She has one in classes three and 18 for perfume and leather bags. She has another one for the lingerie and then she has a third application for kimono as it relates to the retail retail stores featuring the sale of all those things that she just listed above so here's the tea on that all three of those applications are currently suspended for likelihood of confusion meaning that there was already uh, a prior application, our prior registration for the word kimono as it related to the services that she's providing. That's number one. And even if she was to overcome that, there are pending applications that were filed before hers was filed. So she has to wait and see how that turns out. And they didn't like to, they also didn't like the way that she classified her goods. She made the classifications too broad. You need to, when you're when you're filing your trademark application, they want you to be as specific as you can about how you're going to use that mark. Because remember, trademarks are only good, your, your protection is only for how you use the mark. So if you say apparel, 
right? You can't just sell a, a trademark for apparel when the only thing you sell are t-shirts because apparel encompasses so much. Are you selling dresses? Are you selling men's shirts? Are you selling track suits? What do, they want to know, what, what are you doing? And so they asked, they asked um, Kim to, to narrow down or to be more specific about the type of um, application she's filing. But even if she does that with the classifications, she still has to overcome the likelihood of confusion claims that USPTO has issued in the office action. And from what I see, she, she might not be able to. So those are the first three. And those were filed, those three applications were filed in April of 2018. The next one, she has two more for kimono intimates. Kimono intimates. So the first trademark application for kimono intimates is filed for perfume and retail store. And then she has a third one for clothing. So for the same, she has kimono, that she has kimono intimates in the same classes as she has kimono, which doesn't really make any sense to me because you have to disclaim the word intimates. When it comes to trademarks, there are certain things that you can't get a trademark over and anything that describes a feature of a product or service, you won't be able to, to get a trademark for it. So sometimes when you have, let's say you have, you have a motorcycle club, right? And you call it the Brown Building Society. And I'm saying that because I'm, I'm looking at a brown building across the street from me, right? So you call it a Brown Building, building Society. Well, society indicates club. When you think about society, it's, it's typically like a club or a private organization. So you wouldn't be able to get a trademark for society. So what you would do is they would ask you to disclaim the word society. And the disclaimer language says, it'll, it'll ask you to say, for, for a disclaimer, you would have to say, no claim is made to the exclusive right to use, in this case, the word intimate apart from the mark shown, meaning let's say someone else had a motorcycle club and they wanted to call it the Green Tea Society, right? They would be able to call their motorcycle club Green Tea Society because the Brown Building Society has no right to exclude other people from using the word society. And I'm hoping that makes sense for you all. And because of that disclaimer, it's essentially like filing the same trademark twice because you have now you have kimono you have a trademark for kimono, you have a trademark for kimono intimates, which is essentially with the disclaimer, kimono registered six times, but she has a total of, she has three applications for kimono and three applications for kimono intimates. All six of those applications are suspended um, due to, and when do we suspend an application, what that means is the, uh, the USPTO is not making a decision on whether or not you can move forward with, with registration until they see what happens somewhere else or until whatever issue may be resolved. And so in this case, they, because the application um, conflicted with pending applications, you can have your application suspended until you see what happens with that application that was filed before you. Because if the application filed before you doesn't get approved for a reason or if they abandon it or decide not to move forward, then you can move forward. But like the office in the suspension letter, it says, okay, in this particular suspension letter, it says, okay, we're going to suspend your application until we find out what ha was happening with the pending applications. But that's not going to resolve this other likelihood of confusion with these prior registrations. So we're going to suspend it. But after suspension, you still have this likelihood of confusion um, obstacle to overcome. So we, get, we have to see about that. So, so far, it's not looking too good for Kim K and Kimono Intimates. It's not, they have six other 11 applications have been suspended for likelihood of confusion. Let's continue. After that, she has Kim, no, Keek, Keek Kim Mono, like she spells it different. Instead of Kimono, which is K-I-M-O-N-O, -O, she has K-I-K-I-M-O-N-O. That's how she's pronouncing, that's how she has, that's the next trademark she has. And that's also filed under lingerie and it was allowed. So that one was filed in October, 2018. She filed a 1B application which says, hey, I'm not using this mark in commerce yet, but I intend to use it, right? So it goes through the entire trademark review process just as if she were using it in commerce. And then at the end, of the publication, it was published without any objections. And at the end of that publication, 
instead of her being issued a certificate of registration because she was because she filed a, a 1b application she was issued a notice of allowance and she has six months to submit proof that she's actually using the mark in commerce and her application was filed in october 2018 in that notice of allowance so she's within her six months time frame to file her notice of allowance for and i can't pronounce it but it's i would call it key kimono key kimono but it's for lingerie, shapewear, baby doll pajamas, stockings, and things of that nature. So she has that. That's her seventh trademark. And that one looks like it's going to be approved. So her next mark that she filed an application for is Kimono World. Kimono World. And she filed it for leather, leather belts, bags, and the shapewear. She got an office action for that. Now she filed this application in March of 2019. And typically... What, uh, what we typically what happens is the application sits in USPTO's database for three months before it's assigned to an examining attorney. Three months. So this one was just assigned to an examining attorney and it was issued an office action. That office action, again, is, has a problem with the way, with the identifications of the, of the goods that are being filed in the application. That's one thing. Um, some of the things they say that she's filed in the wrong class, and those two things aren't too big of a deal. You can fix those. The third thing I thought was really interesting, especially after how everyone reacted yesterday, was that she received an office action saying that the entire mark may potentially be deceptively misdescriptive, which means, and so when you file a trademark, you are not allowed to file a trademark for something that misidentifies and can confuse the consu consumer about what they may be getting. So in this case, they're saying the word kimono, which is a Japanese garment, it's a long robe and it's known for how it's shaped in the sleeves, right? That that is an actual garment in a wear and that the people wear and people associate kimono the word kimono with that. So they ask her, are you selling kimonos in your in your retail store? Is that included in your application? Because we don't, they're saying, we don't see that in your application. We don't see that in your application. So we need you to clarify whether or not you're selling kimonos or any of these things have to do with kimonos. And if, if it does, you're going to need to disclaim the word kimono because you can't again the word describes what you're selling if you're if your application if you're going to tell us that you're selling kimonos then you're going to have to disclaim the word kimonos because kimonos are known as these garments these long robes japanese long robes and you can't get a trademark for that you can't get it because all you're doing is describing what you're selling and you can't get a trademark for that so you're going to have to disclaim that word that's what they're saying right and they're saying, but on the other hand, if you're telling us that you're not selling kimonos, then people are going to be confused because Kimono World, they have whole stores and retail stores that are dedicated to selling nothing but kimonos. So when someone enters Kimono World, they're going to be thinking that they're, that's what they're buying and that's what they're coming there to get. And you're telling us that's not what you're doing. And it's going to be reasonable for them to expect that because it is a, a, a clothing store, you're in this class, it's an apparel, and kimonos are apparel. That's, that's the problem that she's having with this application. And like, either you're selling kimonos, and the word's descriptive, or you're not selling kimonos, and you're mis, misguiding people, you're misleading people. Which one is it, Kim K? Which one is it? That's what they want to know. So we're definitely going to keep an eye out to see how they respond to this office action. And she got that same office action for her next mark that she filed for, which was kimono solution wear. The same thing. The same thing. Um, but the most interesting thing about the kimono solution wear to me is that kimono solution wear, it was filed in April of 2019 and an office action was issued in May. I haven't, I haven't known USPTO to move that fast without an expedited application. And there, were, I didn't, there was no indication that this was 
that. But yeah, so an office act, they filed it in April 2019, and in May, they were like, nope, sorry. You can't, this is, you, this is not the business. You can't, you can't register this. We have some problems with your application, right? That's what they were like. And, and the same thing that we just talked about for Kimono World, it's the same office action that she got for Kimono Solutions. And when these office actions are issued, they are issued to different examining attorneys. So that's why you, might, you, you have one examining attorney that's like, oh, okay, yes, this is fine. And then you have another one that says, oh no, I got a problem with this. The next trademark she filed is not for Kimono, but it is just for um, Solutionware. And Solutionware is filed for luggage bags, leather bags, and the retail store. And for clothing, as it relates to lingerie, shapewear, baby doll pajamas, and the same things that she filed for with the other classes. It was filed in April 2019. It hasn't been issued to an examining attorney as of yet, so we don't know what's going on with that. She has a logo that she filed for, and um, it's like a stylish mark of kimono. It was filed in 2019, which was, it was filed just a couple of days ago. When that, yeah, so I think that's what kind of set the internet on fire, because I'm gonna tell you, like, like I said, a lot of these applications were filed back in 2018. So this one just hit in 2019. And that's the one, this is the one that's like, oh no, why did she do this? But it's a logo mark. So we don't know what's going on with that application yet because she just filed it. And then the last one that she filed was for kimono body in the same classes, which would be luggage, the shapewear, and the retail store. So we wanna keep an eye out on this whole entire situation. I told you, that that tea was hot, didn't I? So everybody, we know we're upset. She shouldn't be appropriating other people's cultures. Why would you do that? But let's see if USPTO is going to let her do it, if, she, if she's even going to be able to do it, okay? One, she has the problems with the previous registration. People ha already have a trademark for that. Because I told you, when I looked in the database, there were over 100 trademarks filed using the word kimono. So she has to overcome the likelihood of confusion, meaning that when people see her her mark, are they gonna think about this other mark, these other marks? Because they are so similar, right? So similar. So that's what we're gonna keep an eye out for. And we're gonna definitely take keep an eye out on Kimono World and Kimono Solution Work just to make sure or see if she's able to overcome that potentially deceptively misdescriptive um, claim that USPTO alleged in their office action against her, right? So we always hit you with the three top takeaways. The thing that we can take away from this is one, do a trademark clearance search, do a thorough trademark clearance search just to see what's out there. The attorney should have known and seen that these other applications were already out there. Now, sometimes, and I will tell you, when it comes to pending applications, depending on when they file compared to when you file, you might miss it because it takes a couple of days for your application to hit the database for the public. So if I file an application today and you file one tomorrow and you do a trademark clearance search tomorrow um, for to see if there are any conflicting marks, you're not gonna see my application because that window there. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna file and then you're gonna get this office action. You're gonna be like, what? But you just didn't see it because it, wasn't, it hadn't hit the database yet and there's nothing that we can really do about that. But the number one takeaway from this is definitely do a trademark clearance search so you know what's out there. Because if you're gonna be spending your money uh, to protect your brand and even before you go and doing like you want to see what's out there and the likelihood that you are going to be successful. And if there is someone else out there, like how much money is going to cost for you to be able to resolve this thing so that y'all can coincide together? Because that's another thing too. You can negotiate with the conflicting party and they can say, okay, we can both use this mark, but it might cost you a little bit of coin. That's so that's takeaway number one. Do your trademark clearance search, okay? And the number two takeaway is don't wait. You do not have to wait until you launch to file your trademark. You do not have to wait until you're making some money to file your trademark. That is the number one way to end up paying more money in legal fees 
when you wait because what can happen is while you're branding and things of that nature someone can beat you to the punch and they don't have to just file your trademark maybe theirs is slightly different but it's still so similar that it can cause confusion in the marketplace because remember they don't uspto is not just looking for same they're also looking for similar so yes the marks might be different but they can still be similar enough to, to allow or to force you to rebrand and so we want to go ahead and have that stuff resolved in the in the forefront beforehand so we know that there aren't any problems when you launch that right so do not wait you do not have to wait until you launched or made some money and i can understand the concern right because you're like if i'm not gonna make any money i'm not gonna keep doing this and i feel like if you have that type of mindset then you don't need a trademark anyway because when you go into business you understand that it's a risk right but if you do your work in the front then you are prepared for that i'm not going to say that the road is going to be easier but you are prepared for that because you've been honest with yourself so if you done your you have your your business plan your marketing plan you know who your clients are and how you're going to what avenues you're going to sell in and how you're going to sell and how much you're going to sell for and all those things then yeah you can talk about getting a trademark but if you haven't done any of that then don't even it's not time and if you haven't had an honest conversation with yourself like i can do all of this and I won't be as successful as I think I will be when I think I will be because it it, it it does take time. The internet makes it look so easy, doesn't it? The internet makes it seem like, oh, I'm going to put up this website and then, oh, guess what? I've been in business for a week and I'm already a millionaire. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, yeah, that's not how that works. That's not how that works. So if you don't have the stomach for loss... If you have not done your homework by preparing for your success, don't file a trademark. But if you have done all that, then you want to make sure you tie up your mark so that no one beats you to it and you don't have any problems later on down the line. And the third takeaway is sometimes you can do all the things that you're supposed to do and still have challenges in your application. You can do your trademark clearance search. You can file your application before you launch, but you can still end up with challenges because trademarks are not as simple as they appear. There are a lot of legal nuances in there that you need professional help to overcome, which is why I do what I do, right? That's what I do what I do and I love it. But you need to be aware of those things when you're when you're filing your application. Listen, people, have you subscribed to my channel? Wasn't this tea hot? Wasn't this tea hot? Subscribe to my channel. Do not forget to subscribe to my channel. Um, have, are, have you done it? No, I'll wait. Okay, you did it? Awesome. Listen, if you want to know more about trademarks, if you want to know more about protecting your brand and owning your genius through trademarks and copyrights, I want you to take the Own Your Genius Challenge. It is a free challenge. It's, it's absolutely free. And it's a five-day challenge. And during that time, I'm going to teach you about trademarks, copyrights, patents, trade secrets, so that you will know the difference between all of them and the basics of it and the process to get it done. Like, what does it take to get it done? That's what you will learn in those five five days right take the challenge i'll leave the link below right and that's your legal tea